predator. The mere mention of the word is enough to bring shivers. The lions snarl. The snakes rattle. The wolves howl. Some loathe them. Some love them. You don't have to be told twice to be on your guard. Better stay alert. Are those eyes staring at you? Hungry? Or just curious? Many a Hollywood fortune has been made exploiting the predator-prey relationship. It's time to set the record right. By definition, a predator is any animal that stalks, kills, and eats another animal. That includes all of the animals one normally thinks of as predators, the mountain lion, coyote, black bear, and wolf. But it also includes the diminutive shrew that attacks and devours a savory cricket. When the lucky crickets evade the shrews, they may find a tarantula hiding in ambush. And it's not just large spiders that prey on the unsuspecting. The common garden spider traps a grasshopper in its web. Wrapping its dinner for later consumption, the spider attaches a final strand of thread and pulls it to the center of the web. There is no doubt that large snakes are effective predators, seeking out and making an easy lunch of an unsuspecting prey. The gecko is certainly no match for the tiny night snake's powerful venom. The snake won't go hungry tonight. Almost all of our watery denizens are predators. The largemouth bass is a voracious feeder. Even the much smaller bluegill will empty a competitor's nest in no time at all. Even our airwaves are full of predators. The magnificent bald eagle swoops down and snags a fish from the lake, taking dinner home to the waiting eaglet. Or consider the mighty goshawk. With a few powerful flaps of his wings, the cottontail rabbit falls victim to his powerful talons. The osprey is also called the fish hawk, a name that gracefully displays its predatory nature. As the name implies, this ash-throated flycatcher dines on flies and other insects. Even the beautiful bluebird that many of us invite to our homes is a voracious predator. And don't think you're safe at night either. Bats of all shapes and sizes scour the night skies in search of insects. These predators are so efficient that a single bat can eat his weight in insects every night. And what the bats aren't eating, the owls are. The flammulated owl dines on a small insect, while the larger great horned owl feeds her young on a cottontail rabbit. The cactus ferruginous pygmy owl isn't particular. He'll eat day or night. As fast as the whiptail lizard is, he's no match for the silent, swift flight of the owl. As will the spotted owl, who snatches a field mouse off a tree limb and returns it to her hungry brood.
In the circle of life, predators are also prey. What goes around, comes around. In the natural world, predators help keep prey numbers in balance. But it's prey numbers that regulate predator numbers. But what happens when man steps into the picture? In his efforts to bend nature to fit his needs, man has altered the natural state of affairs. Ever-expanding cities mean the loss of all four habitat components, food, water, shelter, and space in the proper arrangement. Even the simple act of going on a family campout causes the loss of habitat for all things wild. From the roads one drives on that cut across historic migration paths, to campsites built on favored fawning grounds, to the damming of our natural riverways. Most of these losses are understandable and necessary to our business of life. Others are not. That's where the Game and Fish Department steps in. The department is charged with managing all the wildlife in the state, prey and predators alike. When times are good and wildlife populations are naturally flourishing, the department takes a hands-off approach. Why fix it when it's not broke? Central Arizona provides a perfect example of how the department manages wildlife populations when things need to be changed. Prescott and Prescott Valley are antelope country, really good antelope country. But as we build more and more homes in their space and pave over their fawning grounds for shopping malls and parking lots, we see fewer and fewer antelope. Where they were once the largest grazers on the grassland, antelope must now share food and water with other introduced ungulates. However, Arizonans want antelope. Allowing these herds to disappear is not an option. The department's mission then is to figure out how to manage those antelope herds. Limiting factor? Urban encroachment into antelope grasslands. One solution? If the grassland can't come to the antelope, take the antelope to the grassland. And that's exactly what we've done in some cases. But to increase total numbers of antelope in those herds, other management techniques need to be employed. Since we can't manage roads, buildings, the weather, and a host of other limiting factors affecting antelope fawn survival, we concentrate on those things that are in our control. Well, pronghorn um, are susceptible to predators. There's uh, certain times of the year when they're more susceptible than others, and that's uh, primarily in the spring during the fawning season. The predator-prey relationship between pronghorn and coyotes uh, goes back throughout history, and it's okay that that happens. It's one of the ways coyotes survive is by finding uh, newborn fawns to, to eat, and uh, it also just works with the pronghorn in the way that they've evolved by dropping more than one animal, typically. Uh, animals typically twin, and the majority of the herd, the does, will drop their fawns within a one-month window. And the idea there is to saturate the area with newborn fawns, uh, knowing, in fact, that, that many of those fawns will be eaten by coyotes, but that several will survive. And all you're looking for is a, a good enough recruitment or survivalship of the newborn um, so that they can replace the older age animals that are dying out of the herd from other causes. But what happens in uh, an unnatural system is a lot of the things that normally work uh, in that dynamics are changed. Uh, when mankind comes in, for instance, we uh, build roads and houses, and we will um, isolate small populations of pronghorn, for example. And when those pronghorn are isolated, the areas that they have left to them to fawn are limited. As most of us uh, are aware, coyotes do very well in urban settings. So this doesn't really impede the coyote population at all. And so the coyotes are doing well, and at the fawning season, they've just got these small little pockets to come in and, and work, uh, work their grids, and they can find the pronghorn uh, fawns, and they can do more than their share of predation, and that can affect recruitment to the herd. In other areas of the state, uh, there could be other things that are affecting that relationship, such as extensive grazing or just drought conditions. When this happens, predators may still be doing well because they can switch their prey base to whatever is available. Uh, coyotes are opportunistic and they'll take whatever comes their way. But at critical times of the year, those coyotes that are still doing well will continue to uh, 
do it a little bit too well on eating the pronghorn fawns and will get no recruitment. When that happens, the department is faced with a really difficult management decision. Uh, we could sit back and watch and see what happens. We may lose the pronghorn herd over time. It may uh, die out of old age with a lack of recruitment. Uh, we could go in and try to move some of the pronghorn from the area if it's deemed that the habitat is no longer uh, viable and going to sustain any pronghorn for time. Or a final option would be to go in and do some short-term uh, predator control. But predators don't always draw the short straw. Consider the plight of the black-footed ferret. This little feller teetered on the brink of extinction in most of the 20th century. If ever one animal depended on another, the black-footed ferret depends on the prairie dog. When the prairie dog was eliminated from Arizona's landscape, the black-footed ferret also disappeared. In 1996, four black-footed ferrets were reintroduced into holding pens in Aubrey Valley near Seligman. Thanks in large part to the dedicated department employees, black-footed ferrets are now on the comeback in Arizona. This masked bandit with its eerie green eye shine is actually a ferocious predator that stalks prairie dogs in their own burrows, usually in the dead of night. When faced with critical issues involving wildlife predation, such as coyote removal during lambing time, the department's actions are limited in scope and not intended to impact the predator population on a whole. When predator management action is required, the end result is a short-term reduction in the predator population in a relatively small area. The target prey species should immediately benefit from increased recruitment. This respite from predation hopefully will increase total numbers of the species statewide. When this has occurred, the department has effectively managed both predators and prey to ensure that both exist in healthy numbers throughout the state.